this is my um, sexy tulip of the year. I don't know if that's that's the thing, but um, this is like the Alexis Carrington Colby of uh, the tulip world. It's it's a sort of very very eighties lipstick pink, and it's it's like um, shot silk. I don't know how easy it is to see, but that's called a, t- a tilagraffiti leucodendron argentium. It's just the most beautiful tree when it looks happy, which of course it does on Tresco and probably doesn't anywhere else. Another That is another plant I would love to grow. Hello and welcome to episode 43 of Talking Dirty over at East Ruston Old Vicarage, looking a little bit like he's heading on a day trip on a lovely yacht, even though it's absolutely (laughs) chucking it down outside and it's absolutely horrible. We have Alan Edward Herbert Gray, our happy and very handsome horticulturalist. And on this very wet and very windy sort of day here, um, we have thought is Maria Sophia Fredrickson over there in Cambridgeshire with her lovely Lilibet. <laughs> yeah, she's keeping me warm and keeping me snug. We have two busy guests who we've managed to pin down for a podcast and we're so excited to chat to them. Very illustrious podcasters. I feel like we should just sit and learn from the <laughs> brains behind the Talking Heads podcast, which I know so many people who love listening to you guys. We have Dan in Devon, um, we have Saul Walker of Stonelands, and over in Essex, we have Lucy Chamberlain of East Donnelland Hall. Welcome to Talking Dirty. Oh, Hello. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. It's yeah. Talking Dirty meets Talking Heads. That's it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great names. Great names. It's yeah, <laughs> exactly. We're, we're, we're on the same wavelength. Now, you guys, I suppose before we get into talking about your podcast, we should hear a little bit about each of you. Now, Lucy's had the slightly more stressful time getting ready for this podcast. So I'm going to give you some <laughs> moments to gather your breath. Uh, Saul, <laughs> give us a potted history, pardon the pun, of, uh, of you mm. and your gardening endeavours. Yeah, so um, yeah, I've been doing gardening for a fair, well, 20 years now. Um, been a gardener all my life, really, since the teens. My grandparents are big influences on my career. Big garden in Henley on Thames, big two acre garden. So I spent a lot of time there and uh, yeah, just really got into, well, got into plants first, I must say, rather than the gardening side of it. Just love trees and shrubs and realizing they're all different and all that kind of thing. So I went to uh, study and train at, with the National Trust down in Cornwall at a place called Anthony House, which is the ancestral home of Sir Richard Carew Pole, who was the RHS president at the time of me working there. So a really big leg up in the industry and uh, he's always been there on my back and, uh, and wants to know what's going on. Then I went to work at Kew Gardens. I did my diploma there for three years and then specialized in woodland gardens. So woodland gardens are one of my passions. And then I went to work for the RHS. I've been branded by all these big institutions. I like to think I've got tattoos running down my arms and (laughs) trust QRHS. But I went there uh, not to do any gardening, but to work in the shows department and work as the show manager for both Hampton Court and Chelsea Flower Show. So a little bit different uh, and a bit, well, I'd say a little bit more stressful than going out and mowing the lawns. But um, that was up in London, obviously. And I'm a Devon lad, country, coast, just love being outside. So... Me and my partner came back to Devon about seven years ago, and I've been at Stonelands ever since, looking after it. It's a 16-acre garden, just on the outskirts of Dawlish. Um, Pretty typical English garden for the West Country, rhododendrons, camellias, herbaceous, vegetable garden, you name it, we've we've got it in some way. So, yeah, that's that's a very short, potted history there. That was good. He set the bar high, Lucy. Do you want to do the same for you? <laughs> he has. He has. I will try my best. Um, so um, I'm the daughter of smallholders. That's how I came into horticulture. My grandparents were also gardeners and I just was absorbed in it in a, from a really early age. I went to um, Riddle College, then to Y College to do an h and and a degree in horticulture. Um, was going to hopefully take over my parents' market garden business but it was just in a time when supermarkets were really squeezing the market gardens and it was very difficult so I then looked to try other careers um my first job was at 
Wisley. I was a horticultural advisor at Wisley for six years. So yeah, like Saul, I've got the I've got the branded tattoos on yeah. my arm. Um, and that was brilliant. That was I was at the coal face where all the members were asking us all sorts of questions about their gardens and you know what was going on with them, what they wanted to find, um, design ideas, all sorts of it was just brilliant. And I was at the gardens and I could speak to the gardeners about all the questions that were being asked and just pick the brains of these wonderful people. It was such a fantastic foundation for me alongside my education. So I, I'm so I'm so lucky to have had that. It really was just luck. Um, and then I liked the writing side of things. So I then started writing for the garden magazine, the help and advice pages that are now the, the profile pages at the front of the mag. And um, I then got a job at Amateur Gardening Magazine down in Paul in Dorset because I wanted to do the writing full time. I really did enjoy that part of things, just conveying all the knowledge that I'd absorbed from all the fantastic people at Wisley and all my studies and things. That was lovely. Um, so I did that for four years and then I became editor of Grow Your Own Magazine, which is based in Colchester, which is where I am. So it was lovely to come back to where my parents and my brother and friends were. That was very, very pleasant. Um, so I did that for six years, which was a really interesting time it was fabulous being in the chair of a magazine and actually steering it and taking it forward and because it was all to do with growing fruit and veg it felt so complete for me it was like full circle <laughs> coming back to the small holding you know that was it was just lovely but then I was yearning for the practical side of things you know I hadn't been a practical gardener for a, a while apart from in my own hobbies and so that's when the the head gardener role at East Donovan Hall came up and it's so local to me. I, it would be crazy not to take it on. It's literally, as the crow flies, about two miles away from us. I can sit in my bed in the morning and look out to see the, the stable yard. So that's very pleasant. And it's got a walled kitchen garden. So again, you know, I've, I've worked on my parents' small holding. And to then go back to having studied horticulture, having written about, especially for me, edibles, and then go back to looking after a, a lovely estate that's got a wall kitchen garden. Lovely. So... <laughs> Yeah, it's taken me into the crazy tomato lady that I am. That's my hashtag on Twitter. So, <laughs> crazy. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, we've got crazy tomato lady on one hand and kind of crazy exotics guy on the other. That's it. Um, yeah, that is that is T-shirts have um, been made. <laughs> the alter ego, the superhero guys that we have, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it, I think that's actually, it's great for your podcast that you've got both of those angles covered because obviously Alan and I, we do tend to get completely caught up in um in the the plants probably the slightly more kind of ostentatious floral side of things of course your garden alan east ruston is um is a good melange of the two because you've got all of the crazy flowers but then although it's it's something you quite often um you know hand over the responsibility for you've got plenty of beautiful veg and uh, fruit and veg growing going on including your palatial fruit cage oh yeah we do and we do have uh, we have a chap who works for has worked for us for many many years called gary and gary uh, masterminds the vegetable garden every year and we try to make it um we try to make it i mean it's it's organic but we try to make it as interesting as possible and i think that visitors to the garden they often think that we know something that they don't because we grow lots of ornamentals in amongst our vegetables and it really is not for the um for the for the fact that it attracts helps to attract pollinators and predators on pests that you might have but which of course it does um but but it also is to gladden the heart of the person that has to work in that garden <laughs> yeah. the one thing the one thing i hate about it is that every year gary does this most fabulous planting of lettuces and we have one particular area where the lettuces are arranged in such a way that when they're ready i dare not cut one <laughs> <laughs> it's, so too I, it's too ornamental it's too ornamental yeah. you don't he's want done to too do good it. it he's done it's too good a job my little bit of villandry and and you know i just have to have a few lettuces tucked out of the way for for use in the house <laughs> <laughs> lucy are you big into the cooking as well as the growing i am i'm a i am a real passionate i wouldn't say i was a good cook i'm a very passionate home cook i absolutely love that part of thing i mean lately we've been having asparagus at home both in our own garden and also at the hall's bed as well they've got a lovely big bed of asparagus there which is when it starts pushing through it's I get so excited and yeah you know that that side of things I think when you're growing edibles 
when you grow them, but then you also get a real buzz out of cooking them. It, it just fine tunes what you're trying to do. You know, your objectives for growing this produce is because you know it could taste really great. And so when you come to harvest it, you harvest it just at its peak. I get a real pride of taking, we've got some lovely wall trained figs at the hall and I get a real pride of making sure they're just, just perfect at the right point. You know, that lovely weight that they get just <laughs> as they're right before they actually fall into a rotting mess. You know, that <laughs> lovely moment. Then they go into the hall. And I think that the family of real foodies as well. So they, they appreciate that I... At least, you know, I, I do love my cooking, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Lucy, can I ask you something? I mean, I've, I've got my way of cooking asparagus and, and my other half, Graham, he always says, oh, not that horrible stuff. He won't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> but I've got my little way of cooking asparagus. I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you how you cook asparagus. What's your favourite way of, of cooking and serving asparagus? Well, do you know what? Uh, so my parents, one of the crops that they did... Uh, before they retired was asparagus we had about two acres of asparagus that we did as a, a sort of um it was sold at the farm gate actually so it bypassed all the um the commercial value of the crop we actually got the retail price which was quite lucrative for mum and dad and we always have actually just cooked it in boiling salted water loads of butter lots of salt and coarse black pepper and then just have a big plate when you're when you can actually grow asparagus on that scale you can just have a big plate of asparagus nothing else it's the most indulgent thing in the world so that's that's and then you get your fingers in oh it's just you get smothered in butter the more butter, butter you get on your fingers your face the more enjoyable the asparagus is i think Anna. well that's, well it's very good for the skin anyway yeah. <laughs> anyway exactly. I, I just lay my, i lay my spears on an oven dish i just Sprinkle over truffle oil. It has to be truffle oil because that gives you that nice, lovely scent. Mm. And a little dusting of Parmigiano cheese uh, in the oven for about, I don't know, seven to ten minutes, something like that. It's absolutely lovely. That, is, that does sound... That, I'm, I, I tell you, I, my, tummy, I, my tummy's rumbling. I wrap mine in Parma ham. Oh, so hey. wrap it in Parma ham and then just fry it off. No need to do any, uh, any boiling or anything. Just fry that off. Five minutes. Oh. I think that's beautiful. You're more sophisticated than you look. Way! <laughs> <laughs> and you uh, obviously look very sophisticated. <laughs> I was going to say, appearances well are very deceiving. Well yeah. <laughs> also, the, the ham tip, very useful in this household because um, my other half would react very much like Graham when it comes to asparagus or really anything green. It always has to have some sort of ham involved or else mm. he's oh. not going to eat it. <laughs> so you thought, I think if you harvest it and you eat it fresh, literally within like yeah, an hour or so, the flavour... Yeah. Of it, mm. on it literally on its own it's just like it's just amazing that to me I, you can tell if it's been in the fridge for a couple of days and you eat it it's not the same so that's yeah. to me is like get the, the important thing harvest it get it in your mouth mm. <laughs> job done yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so. what i love about you guys is your enthusiasm that is a lot of the magic of the the talking heads podcast but how did the podcast come about how did you two working together when you are you know completely opposite parts of the country how did that happen so me and Lucy first met at BBC Gardeners World Live, where we uh, we do an expert spot, spot I should say. Uh, we, we host an advice desk. We also judge, and we do other things at the show as well. But because me and Lucy were probably on the younger side, I would say, for the judging, uh, we sort of gravitated to each other and started chatting. And then uh, over a few years of doing the advice desk, we were sort of like, you know... There's not many podcasts, and this is probably back when podcasts weren't as popular. There weren't so many, especially gardening podcasts. There was a few uh, that I can, uh, Lee Connolly, who does the Skinny Jean podcast, and there's uh, Richard uh, Suggett, who does the vegetable podcast. Is it the vegetable? I think it's called the vegetable Veg growers, podcast. Yeah. Veg Veg growers Veg podcast, that's it. Mm -hmm. um, and we just sat there and said, there's not many professional gardeners, or head gardeners at least, you know, putting out the sort of more professional side of the industry, trying to build that up and, and sort of give a, a sort of sample of what life is like behind an estate's gates and, and what it's like. So I went on a podcasting course uh, just as an interest. I thought, you know, let's see what it's all about. And I thought, right, let's, because we had to do sort of a, a bit of coursework, just make an episode up. And I thought, I'll go and ask Lucy. I wonder if after all we've talked about, I wonder if that'll interest her. We both do the radio. So we sort of already mm -hmm. have that in our background. But maybe if we just do it ourselves and talk to each other. And we sort of did one episode and then that led on to two, three. And now well, I think we've done 104 episodes of just, oh, we yeah. can't believe people listen. Because it is literally us just waffling <laughs> to each other on a Tuesday or Wednesday night about how our lives are. And we just think, oh, who wants to listen to this? Actually, every time we finish, we go, 
was that okay? Does anyone want to listen to this? And yeah, like you say, it's just, it's sort of built a little bit of momentum. And now we've got a fair listenership and they react with us on social media and stuff. And it's, it, it's more a sort of a personal thing for us rather than anything commercial or, you know, podcasts mm-hmm. are getting very commercial these days and lots of sponsorship and all that kind of stuff. We're just interested in talking about our lives. So I think that's why people enjoy it. And uh, yeah, it's basically us waffling. That's, that's what we <laughs> term it. You know, Alan, I'm sure you found not only on this podcast, but obviously you do the radio as well, that when you are in charge of a garden and people know that you therefore have a vast amount of knowledge, they want to know what are you doing right now? What are your tips and your tricks? And and because you're doing it all the time, you inevitably do also know all the tips and tricks to share. Well, no, you don't know everything. I don't think yet. Well, none of us ever know everything because I mean, there's there's the great thing is that um, even it, even I'm learning something nearly every day. Mm. Um, which is nice. And the, the great mm. thing is about you just mentioned visitors to the garden, for instance, but listen to the radio and so on and so forth. So we listen to you on Saturday, da, da, da. Um, and then we get into conversation that I'm and then, you know, I come out of it the richer for it because they instill in me either some knowledge of uh, about the way that I cultivate things that I didn't know or varieties that I don't know. And I've, my most joyous thing of ever, I mean, I started life like you did, uh, saw with grandparents and everything else. Um, and, you know, the joyous thing is when people suddenly produce something for me, a packet of seeds that they've saved or a plant that they've grown from a cutting and said, we heard you mention this or we saw you write about this. Mm. Have one of ours. And it is, it's just so wonderful. And, and, you know, that's, I mean, uh, to give you a little instance, when I was a, a child and, you know, Granny and I used to go on our bicycles and dress the graves in the local church for relatives and friends and things like that. And gr- Granny always grew cut flowers. And one of the cut flowers she grew was a row of mixed clarkia. And I suddenly thought, well, you know, I must grow clarkia in this garden here, in our garden. I put it in our cutting area. And the amount of young people that didn't know or hadn't mm. seen clarkia was quite amazing. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's, it's lovely when that happens because you're, you're making, I mean, it's, it's now a staple of our cutting garden. We grow it every year and still people are, that haven't heard of it or don't know it. But I mean, it's that's reawakening or awakening to some younger people. Yeah. Just lovely. Mm. And, and you said, you guys, that you get interaction on the podcast. You have been sort of sent things in in the past, haven't you? <laughs> you talk about our aprons. Go on, Lucy, oh. you tell the story. <laughs> Well, yeah, we, we we were so so flattered because, as Saul rightly points out, we're 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 quite, I guess, we're quite sort of like humble in the sense that we just don't know that the podcast is reaching people, and we're not quite sure about it. But obviously, it is because we were sent these lovely his and hers aprons, beautiful, really very high quality aprons. Mm. So th- thank you for the lady who sent them in. Her name escapes me at the minute, but mine actually had on it hashtag crazy tomato lady. Saul's had on his crazy exotics man. So she was a keen listener. And then not even to the point where mine had a tomato on it. And then also a custard cream, which I'd referenced in one episode as being my favorite biscuit. Because us gardeners, we do like a biscuit, don't we? And Saul had referenced this. And that's the, you know, to to, to go to that level and, you know, to send, to take the time to do that and make it and then post it to you. Look, and here we go. Oh, you got your just over there. Sorry, yeah. Nick just passed me by. There you go. <laughs> it's just gorgeous. Isn't that so touching that someone does that? You oh, know? It's, it's just lovely. incredible. So. That is wonderful. Also, biscuit adoration, very important. Alan started this mm. podcast by consuming several dark chocolate digestives. So he's <laughs> he's been well fueled on the biscuit front. <laughs> <laughs> well done. I, no, we, 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 you know, we have interactions from you know, people who get in touch with us almost every episode. Mm. There's a guy in America, in Florida, who has been contacting us for the last year. He didn't have a garden when he started out, and he's been getting all these plants that he sees us growing, and he's grown this little garden. He's, he's, he's been growing this Brugmansia, because I'm a huge Brugmansia fan. He's been growing this Brugmansia now for about, I think it's about three months, and it just flowered the other day. And his excitement at this thing flowering and him being able to get it from a small plant up to flowering, you could tell. And he's not, he, he doesn't seem like he was a gardener at all. He's a complete novice. But he's always getting in touch asking our advice. And I, I think that's the kind of thing that sometimes, yeah, it takes, it takes us aback a bit. Just these people getting in touch and asking. Don't forget, mm. Saul, as well, he's actually got a photograph of you and I. Oh, God, yes. Our, pod, our podcast kind of like branded cover. Oh. 
on his garden gate. And he's got a little yeah. sign up saying that we are guarding his garden. Yeah. <laughs> so this is going on in America. And you just, you know, again, just mind blowing stuff. It's just lovely. I think, I think for me, that's why I've stayed in horticulture so long because you just ten, tend to find that the people who love gardening, just such lovely folk, you know, they are, um, mm. you've got that common connection. You can always talk to a gardener about something like footballers can talk about football, gardeners can talk about gardening. But yeah, I mean, people, they're just safe and so generous with their knowledge and their time. And I love that. I think, and again, you're always learning, like Alan referenced, you're always learning. And I think Saul and I, we've both, both referenced in our personal conversations about careers that if we ever felt like we're stagnating, that's when you want to be moving on. And actually mm. in gardening, you don't, I don't think you do stagnate as long mm. as you've got that passion. And there's, there's so many different plant groups you can explore. There's always something new to learn, which I love. Obviously a big part of this podcast is show and tell. And um, well, Saul, we can definitely see you've got quite a lot to show and tell because you're basically being kind of consumed by plants on the video version yeah, 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 of the yeah, yeah. podcast. <laughs> so I don't know if, if you want to start seeing as lots yeah. of people have probably been looking at those plants around you and wanting well, to know about them that's my big Swiss cheese fan I'm, I'm in my living room so uh, I've got lots of house plants but I want to show you a few things from outdoors so uh, you had Mike Clifford and you've had Jimmy Blake on the previous podcast and we have a very similar taste in plants so I was trying to find things that they may not have shown you. Uh, about a third of my garden comes from Mike so um it's quite difficult. I think a third of many people's gardens in the country come from Mike if they're into exotic plants. Yeah. Um, but one of the things I am really into, or I've been into for about three years now, is proteaceae. So the proteas, the banksia, leucodendrons of this world that are mostly grown in uh, South Africa and Australia. Now, I know Mike doesn't grow many of those. So I've got, <laughs> I've got three examples of my favourites that are looking quite good now. Because one of the things I will say is we've had a terrible year, really, for the start of the exotic, if you grow exotic gardens. My gingers and my brugmansias are just still waiting, really, for the temperatures to start. So trying to choose things that look good were quite hard. Anyway, yeah, let's get this first beast. So this is um, one of my favourite banksias. This is Banksia blechnifolia, which obviously refers to the foliage looking a bit like blechnum, which is the fern, if you know the hard... Uh, the shield fan, is it shield fan, I think? But it's got absolutely amazing uh, foliage when it comes out new. And the great thing is it's complete prostrate. So it all comes from this very long stem. Sorry, it's a really heavy pot. Um, that comes and it will just, it will trail downwards. So it looks really good on a terrace or maybe coming over a wall or something like that. And eventually you'll get the cone flowers. It's quite a young plant still coming out of the stems prostrate so the flowers are on the are, are flowering from the um from the floor as it were but i absolutely adore the foliage hopefully you can wow. see me it through there lovely, it? absolutely lovely. beautiful it looks like an extension of your beard at the moment though <laughs> <laughs> that is that is that's a key category for me choosing plants that they look like my beard um the second <laughs> the second plant uh is a leucodendron that's getting trapped on my orchids there we don't want that there we go this is probably one that actually lots of people have seen which is leucodendron safari sunset that's probably the ground this is a lot bigger than i thought it was. uh there we go and it has this absolutely gorgeous um the flowers in there and there's actually nothing there's nothing to the flowers in some ways but it's actually the 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 foliage around it that gives you this deep red and that you can actually get other varieties which are yellows and oranges but they've they've done especially well in this intense one of the things we have had is a lot of intense UV recently for hours and hours and days on end. So the, uh, anything that gives this colour in lots of sunshine, same with my succulent collection as well, gives this really beautiful colour. Um, and then the last one that sort of is in the same genus is um, Leucodendron argentium, which is uh, the silver, the famous silver trees from South Africa. And they have this amazing, hopefully you can pick it up on the camera, this amazing silvery foliage, which obviously protects it from the sunshine. This is still a small plant, but it'll keep this beautiful shimmering look when it gets older. These can go into quite large trees, something like four or five meters high. Um, and oh, it's just a stunning plant when the, when the wind is going through it and you get this sort of reflection of silvery light off the, off the, off the sunshine. Anyway, so there you go. Can I ask a question, please? Because um, 
well, all the proteaceae, they are very particular about their um, the soil, the compost, and it needs yeah. to be nutrient poor, I believe. Well, it needs to be nutrient poor in phosphates. That's the uh, where they're from. The soils are very low phosphate, so they've actually got uh, specialized root systems called rhizoids that absorb yeah. the phosphate. But if they have high phosphate in their mix, in their compost mix, or whatever you're growing it in. That does them really badly. They, they'll just, you know, sulk and just die. But so you generally need to use quite an acidic mix. Traditionally, peat was used quite extensively because that is low phosphate. But uh, you can get some mixes from Melcourt. Um, not to, the other composts are available, I should say. Um, all right, you're not on the BBC now, you say. <laughs> good, good, good. Um, <laughs> um, the bark based one, which actually does a good job. But the, the key is to make sure it's low phosphate mix whatever you're using it um and i also add some additives some um, uh, uh iron um iron additives and use a bit of sulfur as well just to up the acid more acidic you can make it the better for protein right well Ooh. i know the one the middle one that you showed safari sunset yes that has become one of the and and relatives of that plant of that mm. variety they've become hugely successful and and in the florist trade, really. I mean, they're you know, very mm, You can popular. see why, yeah. Yeah, you yeah. can see why, because it's just, the foliage is absolutely fantastic. You can see that. Exactly. The it's all about colour and form, not about the flowers yeah. themselves. It's wonderful. And I've got to say, that is my garden entirely. Mostly it's all to do with foliage. The flowers are just the extra icing on the cake. Uh, I grow sonkus, uh, all kinds of gingers with different floral forms, bananas, uh, brugmansia. Uh, all kinds of different things. So foliage and form is, is quite key to me. Yeah, I quite agree with you. I think that's most mm. important. That's probably more important in the world of exotic gardens Absolutely. than the flowers. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, um, yeah. I do yeah. hope Dan Cooper, the frustrated gardener who was on last week, doesn't watch this one because um, I know that Leucodendrum argentium was basically top of his Flomo wish list and he's oh, never managed it? to keep it alive, I don't think. So he'll be very jealous. <laughs> Yes. Which is why I, that's why I wanted to know about the cultivation, because I thought Dan will be listening. He'll need to know. <laughs> well, this goes in my cool, cool polytunnel over winter, which will go down to three degrees. I, I think it's mostly the, the wind. If you get a combination of wind, wet roots and the cold, yeah. that's what does them in. But they can take quite a... Look, most proteases can actually go a lot lower than you think, as long as they're dry at the roots and they're not getting a lot of wind through. That's the key. I thought it was interesting. It was a few episodes back on your podcast. I remember you saying something about um, gardening like you were renting, Saul. Um, yes. Which, I, I, again, going back to the relatability yeah. of your podcast, I think is so true. I, I have had the same sort of realisation and I'm not actually renting, but I kind of keep thinking about moving. And so it does really alter the way you garden. I mean... I, mean, I don't know if this has affected you in the past, Lucy, as well, but it, it, sometimes when you're a gardener, you, you do sort of have to put those roots down, even if you might move, because otherwise you're so limited. Yeah, I've, I've, I've had um, a variety of properties in my um, <laughs> life so far, from little tiny studio flats with fold down beds to slightly larger flats to then actually house. And now at last, I've, I feel like we're in our forever home at the minute, which has actually been such a wonderful thing to experience because uh in our garden it's about 200 foot long where we live at the moment and uh we've actually managed to put down our my dream kitchen garden i mean i call it a kitchen garden it's very grandiose stone but it is it, it's it's got all the the wall train fruit the the vegetables we put a lovely cedar greenhouse in there last year it's it to me i've never had the possibility of doing that before you mm. know and and when i was renting i say everything was in pots if i bought something that was expensive i was so reluctant to put it into the ground and um you know it, it does limit you in a way because you there's some plants and that's the whole thing about gardening you, you do have to be quite patient for certain things you know the wall train fruits taking me years to to build up and yes i could dig them up and move them but i i don't really want to i think they're quite happy where they are so it does alter your mindset definitely find that forever home you'll be fine <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But yeah. once you once you find it, the problem is you're so reluctant because I've been renting for 12 years that I found my house and everything's always been in pots. I've been so reluctant to put things in the ground just because you feel like you're going to move on again anytime soon. And you're going to have to leave some of your, you know, some of the things that have taken me years to find. Mm -hmm. But yeah, at some point I'm going to have to bite the biscuit and actually just, just do it and enjoy the garden. And if we do move on, just 
start again. Part of the joy is starting again, isn't it, in some ways, and, and trying something new. you just got to get that in the mind. Yes, it is, because other things come along as well. Yeah. Other, other varieties of plants come yeah. along. Passions change and discoveries are happening all the time. Just look <laughs> at the one array of plants at, at Crig, for instance. Mm. They have a superb range of plants. Yeah. Expensive, <laughs> but the best range you'll ever get, probably. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. <laughs> People also be able to tell we're recording this at lunchtime from the frequent mention of biscuits through the course of this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> No. <laughs> now, Lucy, I know that um, you were originally going to be in your greenhouse for this. I was. Um, we I've got gone. a glimpse of it, but unfortunately, you instantly froze. So. <laughs> I know. So, I'm sorry. I'm not sure it's... if you know, but you froze in a, a brilliant pose. I mean, you didn't look. I, mean, I always look really funny if I get frozen on screen, but you look very stylish um, and sophisticated. <laughs> so well done. I'm relieved. I'm relieved to hear it because I know there's <laughs> other times when you freeze and it's most most unflattering for and, and un, unsettling for everybody concerned. So I'm very pleased. But yeah, I'm looking and I realise I've got I've got I'm in my blue dining room with a blue top on. So I'm so sorry, but I'm going to inject. <laughs> Can I, shall I inject a little bit of green? I've got something here that will make Saul hopefully laugh. I've just got a very <laughs> piece of paper doing beneath my table. Hang oh, on. I know what this is. <laughs> this is a running joke. Oh no! Oh my yeah. god! No, it's not. This yeah, is the not. fig leaf. This is the fig leaf gourd. For so this years, is for two years ago. Yeah, cuc Cucurbita fissifolia, shark's in melon, fig leaf gourd. Now Saul grew these at Stonelands yes. and uh, gave me a fruit when I visited you. And I was going to check what year, when was it? That must have been 2019. Hang on, I've got to put it down. That was definitely 2019. Yeah. Yeah, Fire. well, I'm, I was, I was going to grow it um, in the season of 2020. And I put it in my greenhouse and waited. And I thought, you know what? It's such a beautiful thing. I can't bear to cut into it. And <laughs> then it became a bit of an experiment and a bit of a running joke because that, like I said, it's just sat there. It's now, it is now starting to decay. I've noticed that. Oh, is it? Okay. I'm yeah. glad. So... I thought there was something wrong with my soil for a bit, you know, <laughs> something radioactive was going on. <laughs> no, but like I said, they're, they're lovely, lovely plants. I don't know, Alan, have you ever grown them in your garden? Because they're, they're beasts of things, aren't they? They ramble I've away. Got... We grow a lot of members of the cucubit family and gourds and, and various pumpkins and things like that, but I've never grown that one. I've written it down, fig leaf gourd. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't catch the proper name of it, but that oh, was Oh, sorry. Yeah, oh, sorry. So, yeah, I've seen it at Saul's. Um, I want to grow it myself, but they do take up a lot of room there. A cucurbit that will grow and grow and grow. Um, if you if you local to me is RHS High Tour, and Matt all over there on, on the Global Growth Veg Garden, we'll grow them every year in a big bed. And yeah. You do need space. <sighs> You absolutely, some cucurbits are very diminutive, like yeah. things like the uh, um, cucumber, and that, that's, that's very, very petite and dainty. The fig leaf gourd, it just, it just goes. I've grown a couple of other cucurbits, like you say, like there's a kocha, um, um, oh, there's, there's a few, like the bitter gourd. There's some nice ones out there to try. I will try this fig leaf gourd, because the whole point, Saul gave me the fruit so I could get the seed yeah. to try some in the garden, but, that's one of my little know. tips, Lucy. Uh, when people sort of they they buy, um, let's just take a really picturesque good, the Turks turban, hmm. and you know people are, are, in the autumn they buy a Turks turban or four or five or whatever, and they use them as a kind of autumnal display, like a tableau and on uh, you know as a, a decoration in your hall or something like that. And then they say, "I'm going to grow that next year. I must get some seed." And I always say, "Well, no, you don't need to because the seed is there." Yes. <laughs> Yeah. And you'll get more in that than you'll get in a packet of seed. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Oh, the seed, the seed from the fig leaf gourd. I was having a little read up about it because I do like to learn the history of plants as well. Yeah. And in Mex in Mexico, it makes it's made into some kind of peanut brittle, which is interesting. Really? Yeah, oh. and um, like I say, it's one of these fruits that when you eat it small, it's it's sort of a little bit like a courgette, like a summer any summer squash. But if you let it to mature, the one I've got down there should be the, the flesh should be really sweet and you can make jam from it you can actually make a an alcoholic brew from it because the sugar levels are nice and high so i'm toying oh, yeah, to with it. yeah <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> I so. think um, I think Alan's uh, kind of squash that gets the most attention. And I don't know if you grew it last year, but in the past, that fantastic El Trom is it El Tromboncino. El Tromboncino. Oh, yes. 
Yeah. Oh, the long one. The long one. Yes. I came yeah. in to this radio studio once, and Alan had gone in before me, and he just left the most enormously long <laughs> El Tromoncino on the radio desk on the chair, and I just walked in to the studio, and there it was. <laughs> it's quite nice. <laughs> The most amusing thing in the garden here was I was one side of the hedge and there were two little old ladies in the vegetable garden and one came along and she said, Hilda, Hilda, come and look at this. You haven't seen nothing like it. <laughs> I thought you made their day. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, that's, oh, that's quite an interesting one, but a little oh. different to your fig-leaved one. So yes. that's, that's a, good, a good bit of show and tell. Lucy, what else did you bring from the greenhouse? Well, this is one that Saul will know. It's literally, it's literally like my, my extra limb at the moment because it's so I'm so taken by it. This is um, my seedlings of Agretti. Uh, I've got, I'm trying to grow a few more Agretti this year. This is uh, Salsola soda, which is a halophyte, a halophytic plant, which, which has evolved to, in the Mediterranean basin to thrive in salty coastal situations. It's a very happy in salty soils, but it also will grow in your own garden. It doesn't need salt water to grow you can just water, irrigate it with ordinary water i love it because there's so many novelty veg i've tried um i've referenced the uh, cucumelon and also things like goji berry and i've tried uh, all sorts of stuff that you forage or eat and i'm like mm, it's all right but honestly a gretti it's delicious it is the most scrumptious thing and it's prolific and if you grow it as an annual every year it is a sub shrub if you let it go it will actually become quite woody but then it's not very palatable but if you grow it from seed every year the, the growth is so soft and such and, and by pinching it out to harvest it you then encourage multi-branching of this plant and so by the end of the season you get this lovely hummocky thing that's just green so fresh the flavor is just like um I'm not going to say it's a spinach alternative. I refuse to say that because so many of these novelty veg get labelled as a spinach alternative. <laughs> it's got its own taste on its own. It's really delicious. It's crunchy. It re retains bites. It's mm, wonderful. The texture of it and the, the taste. It's more grass. It's got a very grassy, fresh, zingy taste yeah. to it. And because sometimes even samphire can be a bit woody. But with the great thing about a gretti, like I say, you, you keep pinching it out. That's the secret to getting lots of side shoots but also that really soft succulent growth. you can eat it raw I like it's actually quite nice in salads because it's got that bite to it yeah or you can you can steam it down and then put like a vinaigrette dressing on it or something like that it's it's lovely and you can once again you've got it it does self-seed around in the garden it yeah, is it's a lovely thing oh yeah so I'm, can i just tell you my little story about samphire it's a story against myself for being silly um <laughs> Well, samphire, you mentioned grown on, it grows on the salt marshes, but especially around where I live here in Norfolk. Um, and it's a seasonal de delicacy. It comes along after asparagus is finished, probably. Um, and, you you know, it's sold on all the market stalls and it's traditionally you'd eat it with fish, but you actually cook it and it's sold with these little roots on. You, you actually cook it in water and then serve it and you put it through your teeth and you draw the flesh off the, off the skeleton of the, of the plant. Mm -hmm. So when I got um, my first samphire and I put it in a sauce and I put salt on it, well, that's an idiotic thing to do because it's grown in salt, salt. water. <laughs> so I had, uh, I had a very thirsty afternoon, shall we say. But I have learned <laughs> Lovely. I have learned <laughs> I'm not to do that. <laughs> Uh, Lucy, you, you mentioned the idea of trying novelty veg. Obviously, the, the great thing about gardening, you always want to try different things. And so if edibles are your thing, you want to try the, the, the plant that maybe is beautiful as well as tasty. But so often it doesn't quite go how we want it to. So mm. that, that Agretti is obviously one that has come top of the list. Are there any others that did actually try of that did get top marked? Oh, gosh. Well, I, I'm trying um, things like sort of amaranth and callaloo and those sorts of more kind of like more um, tender. They are in that sense, like a spinach, I guess, in their, in their use in the kitchen. And I'm finding they're, again, very productive and vigorous and you do get a good harvest from them. I have red orash, you know, the mountain spinach that yeah. sort of seeds all over my garden. And I love putting the little tips of that into salads raw. And actually that's, you know, incredibly prolific. It's very easy. It just, Plops itself around wherever you wherever it wants to. If it gets too aggressive, you can weed it all out. It's not. It's very easy to weed out, and it actually looks lovely with my oriental poppies. I've got love that lovely glaucous foliage you get, and then the red of the the mountain spinach. You know, as, as an ornamental, it's really useful as well. So, 
yeah, there's a few, but I, there's, there's quite a lot. I would say 90% of the things I grow that are novelty, that are, that are best described as a novelty. Novelty, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Saul, do you ever get tempted uh, down this route as well? Because obviously you are Mr. Exotics, you are the big exotics guy. But <laughs> but yeah, do you go, obviously at Stonelands, you, you go down that route, but personally, do you explore these things as well? Um. As in veg, do you mean? Yeah. As in edibles? No, I don't have many edibles at home. Uh, generally, it is at Stoneland's. And I've got to say, Stoneland's was the first place that I was actually doing a big veg garden, you know, uh, by myself. So Lucy's coming quite useful uh, for, for her knowledge. There. Ah, now I, um, now I know why I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, no other reason. No other reason I phone you up every day. Um, so I'm sort of learning my way. Um, I, I always find that veg garden's great um, the reason Lucy's really good at it is because she eats so much of the stuff you know she uses it but I find that the key thing for anyone and I always say this is if you're going to have a veg garden make sure it's stuff that you want to eat at the end of the day you know mm-hmm. and then you will look after it and harvest it and, and do stuff I I agree with Lucy the novelty stuff is great um yeah the cuckoo melon was a, there was a the asparagus pea as well I did try that and that's yeah. not, that had never really nice. did it for me I was just going to say, when you talk about the novelties, Lucy, I was going to say, and what about the asparagus pea? Well, it looks very pretty as an edging, but very little else. Oh, yeah. do you know what? The, the amount you get from it as a plant oh. is puny. And yeah. then also they get they go woody so quickly and they don't they don't taste anything like asparagus. You know, honestly, stop referring these plants saying that's what it, it, people trick you into thinking that's what they you, you're going to grow them for. They just don't taste anything like it. Just no. just stop. Right. It's wasting everybody's time. Just stop. <laughs> so, the really great thing is because we know Matt Oliver quite well at Hyde Hall, he is growing all this weird and wonderful stuff. And there mm. is some, you know, there are some gems in that in the stuff he grows, like the Agretti. Mm. Like about. I think there was a purslin he was growing that was quite Yeah, delicious. Oh, do you know, I was going to reference the actual, I've got winter purslin, but I've also got summer purslin. And that I'm going to try in a very drought um, ridden area of my garden, along with the Agretti. I know Agretti is very good, actually, in a really sunny, parched position. And there's the person I'm going to try as well. I think you've got to do it when the plants are quite small. So the root system beds in actually in the area. You can't do them if it's a big transplant. But that's there again, really a lovely texture. I think when you're eating, it's not just so much about the flavour, but the texture of things on your tongue and the yeah. bite that they bring can be, it's quite exciting and it's different. So definitely the purslane. And also I think I referenced the ach- acocha. The, it's a cucurbit that um, is very vigorous. But actually, it does give you a decent yield, and the fruits taste a bit like a green pepper. So it's un- unusual mm. for a cucumber. You don't want to get that kind of pungency to them. But that's a, that's one that it needs room. Definitely needs some room. But that by the end of the season, you're you've got them coming out of your ears, and they taste good. So that's lovely as well. Let others do the experimenting for you. I find <laughs> yeah. in the veg world, and then I'll just take think- whatever's good. <laughs> I think that's a piece of sage advice. I remember many years ago, I was at Great Dixter and Christopher Lloyd, and who, who we, we knew each other reasonably well. And he said to me, um, I said, what are those tubers you've got in that pot there? He said, well, you can have one if, and if you like, try it in the garden. It's called Thladanthia. Um, it's a curky bit, you see. And I said, okay, what do you do with it? He said, well, this is how we grow it. We grow it to cover whatever we want to disguise. It's a very vigorous plant. And then halfway through the season, we rip all the top growth off and off it goes again, has lots of little yellow bell shaped flowers. It's absolutely lovely. What he failed to tell me was it makes masses of tubers under the ground and they stray far away from the mother plant. And suddenly up pops another Sladanthia. But I have to say, I have had my revenge by giving it to lots of people. <laughs> Try this. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> it's obviously great for you, Saul, having Lucy to kind of enthuse you about veg for Stonelands. I'm wondering how much, oh, Lucy, yeah. you have been picking up exotic, the exotic well, mug from Saul. I might yes. just do another, this needs to nicely in actually go just to another show and tell. I've got a few things here on my table. Um, I love, I love ricin. I think I've seen ricin growing in people's gardens. Uh, I'm just trying to see, because I'm actually doing a trial this year. This is, I can't read this one. I need, I've got, sorry, I've moved into the, the lights so often, you know, I can't actually read which one. Is. But I've got, I, I ordered six different varieties from Chilton Seeds because they had a really good selection. And I, I like the idea of growing exotics, but I also find that 
I struggle with the overwintering of them in my glass house because I haven't got the biggest glass house and when and I you you're overwintering pests and diseases and things I'm, I quite like to have a clean glass house at some point so for me growing exotics from seed every year is something I really am looking into a lot and that's again definitely been Saul's input so the rice and I've got six different types I've also got here some amaranth which obviously isn't edible but I'm going to stop eating this one these these are um my little collection of amaranth at the moment I've got eight different varieties of those all all sorts um some are quite compact others are big gargantuan things so I think anyone who loves exotics but maybe hasn't got the greenhouse to overwinter them, but they've got like a windowsill or somewhere where they can start growing them from seed. Coleus is another one I'm doing this year as well. I just didn't bring that one in, but I, I quite like the idea of exploring that. I think that's a, a, another route in because your, your polytunnel that you've got, Saw, and the, the parts yeah. I'm overwintering like my um, uh, music anaphonia, all those, they, they need big old thumping pots to do that. Big, and it big, takes big up a lot pot. of space. So it's just a little sideline I've developed through Mr. Walker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of the things that I'm trying to do at home is establish more what I don't have to overwinter under protection. And I'm getting more and more adventurous as the years go by. So a lot of my ginger collection, I've got about 25 different hadikians, uh, all different species and varieties. And actually about 90% of them I've left out this winter. And I'm finding they're a lot more tougher than I think many people give them credit for so it's things like that, that i'm going to try and send lucy's way when uh, i've got i've got hadikium devon cream here, devon, which is the one i cream. always say devon I yeah we, it's mm. an absolute beast of a hadikium it'll grow from a small little tuber all the way up to something you know that is taking over the garden in a few years but the flowers are spectacular and the scent is spectacular as well and it's tough tough as well probably tougher than dahlias you know, many people are now leaving their dahlias in their garden more and more as they find that they can get away with it. I think a dickium's just the same. I think, you know, if you if you want to protect it, just put a bit of straw or a little bit of mulch over the top in the winter. But I can leave them out all winter and they seem to be absolutely fine. The biggest yeah. problem is, is these cold temperatures this spring, you know, starting to yeah. get them going again. That's been my yeah. big headache this year. But um, I think there's a lot more hadikiums out there, gingers that people grow their gardens and overwinter quite successfully. I'm so glad that you mentioned about mulching soil because um, our garden here on the east coast of Norfolk, believe it or not, we get very little in the way of frost. We've had it this year, of course, but then everybody has. Mm. But one thing that people say to me about hadikiums, dahlias and all the things that we leave in the ground, oh, well, it's all right for you, but you live in, a, but you've got a very sheltered garden. They would say the same to Saul because they would say, well, it's all right for you, Saul, you live yeah. in Devon. You know? yeah. Um, yeah. But the thing about it is that everyone can help themselves by keeping them as dry as possible over the winter by mulching. Mm. I mean, you know, it can be done. So you don't have to say it's all right for you. <laughs> Get out there and do it. <laughs> I've sent Devon cream all over the country now and everyone's saying the same. It's tough as old boots and it, and it makes a really nice clump in a few years. So I think I must get that one. I would love to try it. Oh, let me know. I've, I've just I got five pots that I've got to separate up when the weather's better. I'll send you a bit. That'd be wonderful, so thank you. Um, have we have we been through all your show and tell now, Lucy? I feel like um oh, I've <laughs> got you, one more got if one you want more. to squeeze that in. Is that yeah. okay? But this is going back to edibles. I am, you know, gonna be stereotypically ed edible here, but this is my little I grow lots of different tomatoes, and that, that is my hashtag <laughs> crazy tomato lady. This is my little oh, tomato only a few, trial. Only a yeah. few, Lucy. <laughs> I've done my indoor ones already. I've got yeah. 16 here. I've got another four that just got sent in the post to me yesterday the other day, actually. Um I do love my tomatoes. Um, it's because of my, my parents, again, they grew them commercially. My, one of my earliest memories is when I was three or four. Um, Mum and dad had picked all the tomatoes and I was rubbing the dust off them with a little duster because they, they couldn't go to market covered in dust. So that was one of the things I did when I was so, so young. Um, but it stuck with me. And, you know, I've been in commercial glass houses with, with tomatoes for, for eons with mum and dad. And I never used to like eating tomatoes, but as my palates developed... I love them now. I absolutely love them. So I do every year grow as many as I can. All the, you know, the beef steaks, the cherries, the slices. There's some sun-dried ones coming out now that, that, that dry on the vine. There's so many different types of toms. So it was just to show that, you know, I, I have got this reputation as a crazy tomato lady. And that's the proof that it's, it's, it's within my blood. I can't stop myself. <laughs> I don't think I don't I don't think it's just that, Lucy. I mean, the crazy tomato lady. Do you know she polishes her tomatoes? 
Uh, d- no, don't start her on that. <laughs> don't start her on that, Adam. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Uh, I kind of wonder if we move on to Flomo and the idea of the plant at the top of your wish list, whether it's going to be a tomato, Lucy. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to reveal anything yet, Lord. I'm going to keep quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I might surprise you all. <laughs> I mean, I love tomatoes, but I've never met anybody as enthused by tomatoes as you. I just, I just love to eat. I, I think it's because I love eating them as well. You know, the taste of the, when you get done some that are really sweet, like the honeycomb, which is the sun gold sort of like uh, alternative now. And then you get the beefsteaks that, some you grow, they're so watery, you're like, what on earth is that about? And then you find some. I grow one called um, Tomond, which is oh, the, the flavor of that. And there's another one, Furline, which doesn't look like a beefsteak, but it's class as well. And that the flavor is so good. And I think people in the UK get labeled as not being able to grow very good tomatoes because the Mediterranean will grow better forms. But if you do your research and just grow lots of different varieties, after time, you will find some that taste amazing i also have a basil obsession i won't mention that too much but obviously they go hand in hand (laughs) (laughs) the tomato and basil lady (laughs) well that's that's too big an apron the apron would get too too big too much too much embroidery on that one (laughs) well i suppose before we end up having to to wrap things up on this podcast we should go we've got four of us so we should give time to flomo and we'll go Mm. round. um actually i'll go first mike clifford you mentioned earlier saul I mean, obviously, I follow him avidly. We will be getting him back on the podcast at some point, hopefully in the not too distant future. Not a day goes by that I don't see something fabulous that I desperately (laughs) want um, at Mike's Rare Plants on Instagram. And he put up this oxalis, and I'm never going to be able to say it, oxalis corimbosa oreo reticulata. Um, Go it! Nicely done. Well done. (laughs) But I I mean, I saw that his photo is lovely. I went and did a Google image search and that blew my mind. I mean, just such a wonderful, vibrant, um, yeah, just like a magical foliage plant. And I don't know if any of you have it or, you know, Alan, if you've got it, I want it. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, that's that went kind of rocketing up my wish list because it looked amazing. So that's my flomo ticked off. Uh, Saul, would you like to go next? Yeah, so um, I grow a lot of Araliaceae because I'm an absolute fan of chefrellas and uh, all the panaxes. There's numerous panaxes, but one of the areas that I've started growing is Brassiaopsis. Now, I know probably Jimmy, I think he did show you some Brassiaopsis on his. So I've got Hispida and I've got, um, um, what's the other one? Oh, I forgot what the other, Mitis. I've got Mitis, so I've got those two. But the one I'm really after is Dumacola which is a lot longer sort of spindly leaves. Um, now, I know Krieg have it, so I need to take a visit to North Wales to, <laughs> to relieve them of it. But uh, once I get that, then I have the holy trinity of Brassé Opsis. <laughs> and then I've got to plant them out. That's the problem. They're all in pots because I'm like, oh, I've spent ages trying to look for these plants. I really don't want to plant them and then I have to move. Uh, but yeah, as soon as I've got that one, I'm going to plant all three together. And I think that's going to look pretty awesome when they're grown up. Oh, that will be wonderful. Mm. Okay, Lucy, are you going down the edible route on your Flomo? Well, do you know, I'm not, and I hope Mr. Walker will be uh, duly impressed that I've actually gone leaning towards the tropicals. This is what this, hey. this, is, what you, this is what you've done to me, Saul. You know, oh, you've opened brilliant. my eyes to something. Just, this, is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. this is a plant that I saw a long time ago. It's when I was working at Amateur Gardening Magazine, so back in the 90s. And that was, that's down in Dorset. And obviously in that climate there, you can grow things that are semi-tender, but actually this is a hardy Impatiens tinctoria. Impatiens tinctoria, which I know probably most people into their exotics have probably already got it grown it and worn the t-shirt. But for me, I have seen it growing. It's a massive big Impatiens. Most busy leases obviously are what people are familiar with growing in their you know sort of containers and hanging baskets this thing stands head high and the flowers are this size they're they're massive massive big things the size of a tennis ball they're white with a deep purple throat the flecking is beautiful they're just lovely plants they take you by surprise when you first see an impatience that that's that is that big and they're actually quite hardy so again sorry alan and the flowers are scented as well. Well, yes, yeah, they are, aren't they? I mean, I, 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 
that I have referenced that um, some people say they, they're scent scented and other people are saying that they're not, not quite so. I think there's certain clones that you can get that have got more of a scent. No, to them. Lizzie, it's not. It's different nostrils. <laughs> oh, <laughs> is it? <laughs> I think some yeah, people get it. it. Some, some people get it, and some people don't. Oh. Another impact is for you that's hardly. I don't know whether you know of it. It's called Alguta. Oh, I've got Alguta. Alguta. Yeah. No, yeah, no. Alguta so is a good one as well. This is a new Not world. as big as Tinctoria, but but uh, you know, nick a bit from him. <laughs> <laughs> I've got Tinctoria as well, Lucy. So I'll stick that in my cuttings list for you. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> very grateful. <laughs> I love this. You're going to be very busy posting things, Saul. Yeah, well, no, it's my excuse to go up to Essex, you see, <laughs> just to go and try those tomatoes. I've got to time it right. <laughs> time it, yeah. Already. August, September. That's the yeah. best time. <laughs> oh, well, Alan, what's your FLOMO this week? Well, well, my FLOMO, I suppose, is relatively boring in a way because it comes from these two lovely people we've been talking to <laughs> today because I have to say thank you to both of them because, I mean, you know, you're inspirational, both of you, and I've learned so much. I've got to say... From, from um, Saul, I, I've got to have Hedicium Devon Cream. I'm not begging it, but I mean, if you've got a piece yes. going spare, mate, I would absolutely <laughs> love it. Yeah. Um, I love the thought of it being a gigantic, hardy Hedicium. I mean, we love gingers. We're, we're getting new ones all the time. We bought some quite new ones last year from Pan Global Plants. You probably yeah. know that very yeah. well as well. Um, <laughs> And uh, Lucy, you've inspired me with your tomato talk. Well, it's got to be, haven't you? I mean, Nothing. for somebody that polishes tomatoes, I've got to learn <laughs> something. And, and, and I think the thing that's always rather put me off experimenting with tomatoes, especially those that are grown on the continent and the beefsteaks and things, is the level of sunshine that they get on the continent, which makes me feel that they could almost make any old tomato taste wonderful. Mm. And then we grow them in this country and they don't taste so wonderful. But I think you mentioned a variety called Tourmand. Yes, I did. Yeah. Furline. Furline, yes. That's a really Furline. tasty, really tasty. Furline. Yeah. Well, that that's they are going to be my two flomos from Lucy Chamberlain. Thank you very much. <laughs> Absolutely lovely. Um, I'll be bringing you up. I don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We get very poor reception in Fingering Home. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this has been an absolute riot, guys. Thank you so much. It's been so much fun. Um, I mean, long may the Talking Heads podcast continue. I assume you are going to be beavering away, to churning out those episodes. I should say they come out on Saturdays. We do one a week and then an occasional interview now and again so there's at least one a week yeah plenty Brilliant. to keep us busy i've been listening to you as i've been doing my couch to 5k so you've been getting me through the the awful right. running <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much and um yeah we will hopefully catch up again yeah definitely but she's frozen but this, she's frozen there you go this is how it works it's frozen. a very good pose though Good pose. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know about you, Saul, but if I get frozen in a pose, it's normally like... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My other half's uh, over the way, but she's deep in... She's knitting, so I can't get her to... Is she? Anyway. Is she a yeah, knitter? Yeah, yeah. <gasps> oh, big knit, yeah. Hiya! What are you knitting? So I'm knitting... Um, you, you might have heard of it. The Yell cardigan? Yeah! Oh, that's looking wonderful. But, Should we just um, let everyone else go and we'll do a knitting podcast? Yes! <laughs>